good evening. I like that nice, mellow undertone of everybody having a good time this evening and looking forward to the snack and the celebration and everything. Welcome back. We're certainly glad that you're with us this evening. And we're going to start off with hymn number 339, which is Standing on the Promises. I'll play a verse on the trumpet, and then we'll sing it together. certainly a privilege to have you all back this evening looking for a great time uh, with our Lord and Savior tonight looking for a great time in the worship service and then to share good news with you during our business meeting and then just have a great time of fellowship with our snack night and baby shower let's begin our service with a word of prayer brother Paul if you would please sir Amen. You may be seated. You're up. We could be seated, but not for long. Uh, we had I had in mind the uh, choir singing this evening, and uh, we changed our mind on that. So they're not up here, but they're out there, and they're singing with you. And I hope that gives you a boost. But uh, I'd like to have you turn to 160, 
And uh, this is a hymn we love to sing, but it's been a long time probably. Uh, just when I need him most, just when I need him most. So we're going to sing the first two verses with you seated, and then we'll have you stand for the last two. By way of announcements, uh, Jack, if you want to come for your missions letter, just by way of announcements, don't uh, forget, uh, Wednesday night we have moved our Bible studies to 7 o'clock. We're doing a series on Baptist distinctives, and uh, we're about two-thirds of the way through it, but certainly invite you to be here for that, 7 o'clock. Our uh, kids' activities are at 6.30 to 8, and uh, so I hope you can make it out for that. Also, don't forget, we are... Uh, uh, got a couple of new Sunday school classes going on. Tim Schaup is in here talking about how the Bible came to be. And then Bob and Joyce Carsey have a new class for young marrieds out in the choir room. And if you are interested in that, I know they'd be glad to help you. Jack, come with our letter and we'll then take our offering. This is from Al Novak, who is... Uh, chaplain that we support at Forgotten Man Ministries here at the Genesee County Jail. This is kind of a letter that's uh, challenging some uh, of us to, uh, they're starting to begin chaplaincy training now, so this is what he has to say. <clears throat> chaplaincy training ahead. Forgotten Man Ministries and the Michigan Sheriff's Association will again partner, partner in offering jail discipline, cha jail chaplaincy training classes in the greater Flint, Genesee County, our area beginning on March the 13th. Classes will be held at Baker College, Flint Campus. Please share this information with the Christian community since these classes are only held in the area once a year. Those having any interest in this type of Christian ministry are encouraged to check out the Forgotten Man Ministry Genesee County Jail website, and I have that if you need that. 
Having a firm handle on God's Word along with our training classes will enable you to become competent to counsel. Now here is a little note from a, a jail inmate. He says this. Joshua Stant says, Common wisdom says to be wary of wolves in sheep's clothing. But I think that many of the inmates in the jail are like me, sheep in wolves' clothing, in need of a good shepherd to save us. Don't get me wrong, Joshua clarified. Jail is not a desirable place to be, but it was a place that saved me, thanks to the Forgotten Man Ministries. Their devotion is, is undeniable. It's a job for them. They're just trying to shed love on the most <clears throat> broken part of a broken city. And here is some of the statistics that Al is sharing with us. Professions of faith, 113. Bible classes issued, 191. Uh, Bible lessons graded, over 1,200. Bible courses completed, 140. Bible study classes, 172. They have a video ministry they show 20, 20 times. Worship services, they have seven each Friday. And they also have books that they share with the inmates. So if you're interested in the uh, becoming a chaplain, uh, some of the guys are here. Uh, I'm sure that uh, uh, you would uh, really benefit. And as this one fellow said, that's a great ministry that, uh, that saved him and, and with uh, many other fellows at the jail. Fellows, if you want to come forward now. Let's pray. Father, again, thank you for the blessings you've shared uh, with us already today. Thank you for Pastor's message this morning. Pray that you'll be with them tonight as you present your word. I pray, Father, for uh, anyone here tonight that would be interested in becoming a chaplain at the jail, Father, and in Genesee County in general. I pray, Father, that you'll lay that on, on some of our hearts. Thank you for the men, those men who are doing that now. Thank you for Al, who uh, faithfully has been serving you at the Genesee County Jail for a number of years. I pray, Father, for those inmates that, uh, that hear the word, that you'll continue touching their hearts. And thank you for the many decisions that have been made already. And, Father, I thank you for this time again. I ask that you'll take the offering. I pray it will be used to bring honor and glory to your name. For in your name we pray. Amen.
a song about our eternal hope over the sunset mountains. Let's sing together, shall we? Starting out with As the Deer. Say 
Master, you have some music for us. Looking forward to it, thank you. Since we're honoring Billy and Katie tonight and their new son that's coming and their introduction to parenthood, this is a song that uh, I sung some time ago here and it takes a different look at parenting and it's called Love Them While We Can. Bibles, please, and let's go to 1 Kings. We've been doing a series on prayer, and we're going to take a little break from that tonight. This morning, we talked about the powerful prayer of confession and cleansing and consecration from King David in Psalm chapter 51. 
I have to confess to you right now, I am a liar and a hypocrite. I had lunch with a couple today, and I told them that I would never use this pulpit and direct it to one person. And then if I ever did, that I would resign from my position immediately because of an abuse or over-abuse of this pulpit. Having said that, tonight will be my last sermon. Because I'm going to address this sermon to Billy Wiley and to Katie and to all parents and to all of us here. So I hope you'll understand. If you look at 1 Kings chapter 2, this is an unbelievably endearing message from a father, David, to his son, Solomon. And I hope tonight that this will be a help to Billy and Katie and to all of us that are parents here as we look at this text. 1 Kings chapter 2, let's start in verse 1. Now the days of David drew nigh that he should die. And he charged Solomon his son, saying, I go the way of all the earth. Be thou strong, therefore, and show thyself a man. And keep the charge of the Lord thy God to walk in his ways, to keep his statutes and his commandments and his judgments and his testimonies, as it is written in the law of Moses, that thou mayest prosper in all that thou doest, and whithersoever thou turnest thyself that the Lord may continue His word which He spake concerning me, saying, If the children, if thy children, take heed to their way, to walk before me in truth with all their heart, with all their soul, there shall not fail thee, said he, a man on the throne of Israel. Moreover, thou knowest also what Joab, the son of Zeruiah, did to me, and what he did to the two captains of the hosts of Israel, unto Abner the son of Ner, and unto Amasa the son of Jether, whom he slew and shed the blood of war in peace and put the blood of war upon his girdle that was about his loins, and in his shoes that were on his feet. Do therefore therefore according to thy wisdom, and let not his whore head go down to the grave in peace. But show kindness unto the sons of Barzillai the Gileadite, and let them be of those that eat at thy table. For so they came to me when I fled because of Absalom thy brother. And behold, thou hast with thee Shimei, the son of Gera, a Benjamite of Bahurim, which cursed me with a grievous curse in the day when I went to Mahanaim. But he came down to meet me at Jordan, and I swear to him by the Lord, saying, I will not put thee to death with the sword. Now, therefore, hold him not guiltless, for thou art a wise man, and knowest what thou oughtest to do unto him. But his forehead bring thou down to the grave with blood." So David slept with his fathers and was buried in the city of David. And the days that David reigned over Israel were forty years. Seven years reigned he in Hebron, and thirty and three years reigned he in Jerusalem. Then sat Solomon upon the throne of David his father, and his kingdom was established greatly. I want to focus just for a few minutes tonight on verses 2, 3, and 4, basically. David said here to Solomon, I am about to to die. He says, I go the way of the earth. This brave young man who had no fear in killing bears and lions as a shepherd, this valiant young soldier who killed uh, a giant that all other men were afraid of, this tender-hearted young man that dearly loved his friend Jonathan, was about to die. And so, as he is very near death, he gives some very kind and straightforward and honest words to his son that was going to take the throne. If you were to look at Acts chapter 13 and verse 36, you would find that David served his own generation by the will of God. It says that David was a very good servant to the Lord in his generation. But David here, in his challenge to his son Solomon, is is saying... I have just as much concern for you and your generation, Solomon. Solomon, when he was at about this age, was somewhere in the neighborhood of 12 to 20 years old when David was to die and Solomon was to become king. But Solomon had lived a very sheltered life in the palace 
of the king, and he needed this admonition from his father David. And David's charge to Solomon was very simple, as we're going to see in these verses, and it was this, be obedient to the Lord. Obedience is probably the earliest lesson we learn as children. It is probably the uh, earliest lesson we teach as parents. It is probably the most difficult lesson to learn. It is probably the most difficult habit to form, that is, obedience. It gives the richest blessings, but it is also the, the hardest to practice. As the song states, obedience is what? The very best way to show that you believe. Right? So let's look at three points this evening regarding David's uh, lesson, his admonition to his son Solomon. And the very first point is this. Number one, David tried to teach Solomon that obedience means knowledge. Look at verse 3. Let's read it. 1 Kings 2 and verse 3, And keep the charge of the Lord thy God to walk in His ways, to keep His statutes and His commandments and His judgments and His testimonies as it is written in the law of Moses. This father told his son that it was far more important to obey your heavenly Father. David looked at Solomon and said, you will be a wise man if you will come to know God in every way possible. If you will come to serve Him, to love Him, to cherish Him, to honor Him, to worship Him, and to praise Him. Dads and moms, there is no greater favor that we can do to our children than to teach them about our Lord Jesus Christ. We live in a technology driven, smartphone texting world. And that's all our kids know. Unfortunately, that's all we as adults know. I don't want to discount technology. It can be a great asset. But we as parents have a far greater responsibility than to teach our kids how to get by with their smartphone. We need to teach them the ways of God and His Son, Jesus Christ. And if we don't do that, we fail as parents. We are to teach them about God. He says, yes, it is important that you learn from and and obey your earthly Father. But it is far more important that you obey your heavenly Father. Proverbs 32 and verse 8. Many of you know this verse. I will instruct thee and teach thee in the way which thou shalt go. I will guide thee with mine eye. And and, and dads and moms, this should be a life's verse for all of us when talking about raising our children. God says here, I will instruct thee with mine eye. This verse tells us that we have the obligation, the responsibility to instill obedience through teaching and instruction and guidance and exhortation and admonition and discipline. Point number one, David tells Solomon that obedience means knowledge. Point number two, David tells him that obedience means being a man. Look at verse two. I go the way of all the earth. Be thou strong, therefore, and show thyself a man. David wanted to teach his son Solomon at the age somewhere uh, of a teenager to be a man. This is not an easy task. This is certainly a lofty expectation. Hold your place, but go back to the book of Deuteronomy, if you will, chapter 31. Here we have an account between Moses and Joshua. Deuteronomy chapter 31, and let's start in verse 1. All right, Deuteronomy 31, verse 1. And Moses went and spake these words unto all Israel. And he said unto them, I am 120 years old this day. I can no more go out and come in. Also, the Lord has said unto me, Thou shalt not go over this Jordan. Now look at verse 7. And Moses called unto Joshua and said unto him in the sight of all Israel, Be strong and of a good courage. 
For thou must go with this people unto the land which the Lord has sworn unto their fathers to give them, and thou shalt cause them to inherit it. And the Lord, he it is that doth go before thee. He will be with thee. He will not fail thee. Neither forsake thee, fear not, neither be dismayed. So just as Moses was encouraging Joshua here to be a man, David was doing the same thing with Solomon. And, and for us as dads, we must give our sons that same admonition to be to our sons that they would be the man that God wants them to be. And that's exactly what David is trying to do here. David knew what it meant to be a man when he showed the courage that it took to kill these bears and these lions out in the wilderness. David knew what kind of courage it took, what kind of faith it took to take on Goliath. David knew what kind of a man it took to look at his best friend Jonathan, who was willing to give up his own life, who was willing to give up his own reputation or his own uh, 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 relationship with his uh, evil father Saul. And David understood that in, in his relationship with Jonathan. And as a man, David said, the love of Jonathan is great. David, as we learned this morning, knew what kind of a man it took to bow down before God and say, I am a sinner and I confess my sins before you. You know, there are many facets of life that we must teach our children as parents. Kindness, forgiveness, long-suffering, honesty, charity, tenderheartedness, true friendship, good work ethic, faithfulness, unconditional love just to name a few. But in telling his son Solomon to be a man, <clears throat> David also gave him a warning that we'll see. Go back to 1 Kings chapter 2, if you will. We will see a warning that David gives him to keep an eye on his enemies who were lurking out in the shadows. Look at 1 Kings chapter 2 and verse 5. Moreover, thou knowest also what Joab, the son of Zeruiah, did to me, and what he did to the two captains of the hosts of Israel, unto Abner, the son of Ner, and to Amasa, the son of Jether, whom he slew, and shed the blood of war in peace, and put the blood of war upon his girdle that was about his loins, and in his shoes that were on his feet. Drop down to verse 9. Now therefore hold him not guiltless, for thou art a wise man, and knowest what thou oughtest to do unto him. But his whore head bring thou down to the grave with blood. So in his charge to Solomon to be a man, he said you had better keep an eye on your enemies. What is it the saying? Keep your friends close. Is it, what is it? Friends close and enemies closer? Something like that. Yeah. But just as David warned Solomon to keep an eye on your friends, David said, but you better remember who your friends are, and treat them with kindness. Look at verse 7. But show kindness unto the sons of Barzillai the Gileadite, and let them be of those that eat at thy table. For so they came to me when I fled because of Absalom thy brother. Proverbs 27 and verse 10 says, Thine own friend and thy father's friend forsake not. So point number one, David tried to teach Solomon that obedience meant knowledge. Point number two, he tried to teach him that obedience meant being a man. Finally, point number three, obedience will bring blessing. Look at verses three and four. Let's read it again. And keep the charge of the Lord thy God to walk in his ways, to keep his statutes and his commandments and his judgments and his testimonies as it is written in the law of Moses, that thou mayest prosper in all that thou doest, and whithersoever thou turnest thyself, that the Lord may continue his word, which he spake concerning me, saying, If thy children take heed to their way, to walk before me in truth with all their heart and with all their soul, there shall not fail thee, said he, a man on the throne of Israel. What David is saying to Solomon here is a, a repeating of 2 Samuel chapter 7, verses 1 to 17, which I believe is the Davidic covenant between God and David, where God was telling David, if you will keep my commandments, if you will keep my statutes, if you keep my laws, I will bless you beyond measure. But God did to David as he did with so many great men in the Bible. He said, if... 
you fail to do that, if you fail to keep my commandments, there will be cursings not only on you, but also upon your people. You know, one of the greatest things to read about our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is that His lineage came through the lineage, the house of David. But we as fathers have a obligation to educate our children about the future and present blessings of the Lord that will come when we choose to be obedient to God. Mary and I started yesterday afternoon doing premarital counseling with Andrew and Eunice. They're getting married this July. And it is exciting to me when a couple calls me wanting premarital counseling. And I ask them, why do you want premarital counseling? And I ask them, why do you want a church wedding? It's very simple. They want God to be first in their marriage. Crucial. And, and, and we talked about some things. And we talked about how even more important in their marriage is each one of their individual relationships with the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and, and I showed them, if I can show you this beautiful picture. This is marriage right here. See this lovely triangle? This is marriage. And what happens is we have God up here. We have Andrew over here, and we have Eunice over here. As they grow in their individual relationships to the Lord, they can't help but draw closer to each other. Unfortunately, this is what, and Billy and Katie saw this too, this is what happens in most of our marriages today. Everybody wants to be in God's house with God's man and God's word and God's prayer and God's music and God's blessings, but then as soon as we walk out of the church, God is left at the altar. So here's what we have. We have God and Andrew and Eunice all down here together. But then after the wedding, Andrew goes this way, Eunice goes this way, God's left down here. Folks, we have such a tremendous obligation to put God first in our marriage and in the raising of our children. You know, I'll be honest with you. It would, it would be a crime if you did not allow your children to learn reading, writing, and arithmetic. It would be a sin against God if you fail to teach them about the Lord Jesus Christ. Because the truth is, they can get along in life without reading, writing, and arithmetic. They can't get along without the Lord Jesus Christ. So I would encourage Billy and Katie as we celebrate with them tonight this new baby that's coming, that they would keep God first. We have, I don't even want to know, at least three, possibly four ladies that are great with child right now. God help our nursery and nursery workers because it just ain't big enough. What a privilege to raise children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Heavenly Father, how I pray. Lord, help us as a church to lift up Billy and Katie, to lift up young parents in our church who are raising young children. Help us to lift up parents who have teenage children. Help us to lift up grandparents that have a hand in raising their grandchildren. God, how I pray that we would lift up these dear young couples that are soon to give birth. Lord, how we need to 
support these people in prayer. I believe David had a premonition, even in the Old Testament, of what Paul told us in the New Testament. When David told Solomon to be a man, I believe that David knew it was going to take a man to withstand the wiles of the devil and his demons. The devil wants nothing more than to ruin marriages and families and children. Lord, I pray that in this church you would be with each and every teacher that has the privilege every Sunday of teaching young people. Help us not to see it as a duty. Help us not to see it as an obligation. Help us to see it as a humbling, intimidating, be yet unbelievably rewarding privilege to raise these children in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for David who loved his son so much that even in his dying day, he gave him words of admonition and encouragement. God, thank you for your word. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's sing number 545, Living for Jesus, 545. Shall we sing?